would Russia change if Putin died tomorrow? Oppose Vladimir Putin drops dead tomorrow. He has to drop dead one day, after all. Will the chastened Russian elite and public decide to abandon dreams of empire and vow never again to fall for the lure of the autocratic strongman? Putin will leave a sick country that ought to be yearning for change. The myth that Russia is a military superpower, which did so much to intimidate its neighbors, lies broken amid the burned-out ammunition dumps. Putin's unprovoked attack on Ukraine provoked Finland and Sweden to join NATO. His aggression has reinvigorated the West and pushed it into supplying Ukraine with advanced weaponry. Russia is poorer, weaker and looking to a future as a Chinese client state condemned to pay homage to the Middle Kingdom as it once paid homage to the Mongol Empire. Unverified Russian sources claim that Vladimir Putin himself is sick, suffering from either cancer or Parkinson's disease. The CIA doesn't believe them, and says the dictator is entirely too healthy? But just suppose he's gone by tomorrow. According to Orlando Figa's The Story of Russia, out this week from Bloomsbury. The chances of the Ukraine disaster pushing Russia towards liberalism when Putin belatedly takes his leave of us vary from the faint to the non-existent. Despite its grim themes, I need to say before I go any further that this is a wonderfully generous book. Figas has distilled a lifetime of scholarship on Russian history to produce a sweeping account of the burden of its past. As Stalin rewrote history in the 1930s, the Soviet joke went that the past changes so often you don't know what's going to happen yesterday. In the 21st century it is dispiritingly clear that the worst aspects of Russia's past have not changed. Imperial nationalists can always revive them. They mythologize them for their own purposes, of course, and wrench them out of their context. But there is always enough in Russian political culture to justify violence, self-pity, exceptionalism, paranoia, autocracy and warts of imperial aggrandizement. Take today's oligarchs, who once seemed to be leaders in modern excess and vulgarity. For all their success in seducing Western bankers and politicians in the 2010s, they were not powerful, independent figures which is why Western sanctions against them have not changed Russian policy. Their wealth was always dependent on a Putin. Since he forced Boris Berezovsky into exile in 2000 and arrested Mikhail Khodorkovsky in 2003, Putin has delivered an old and blunt message. As long as the oligarch's interests remain subjugated to those of the regime, he would allow them to enjoy their fortunes. If they crossed him by supporting opposition politicians, or by refusing to pay the required bribes, he would destroy them. Little has changed since the Tsar told the boyars of Muscovy that their wealth and power depended on his whims. Early modern Russia never developed concepts of private property or of strong independent institutions that might have tamed autocracy, and their absence is felt to this day. Figures makes the controversial argument for Russian nationalist historians that the domination of Moscow by the Mongol Empire from the 13th to the 15th centuries did more than any other factor to fix the basic nature of its politics. First Moscow's princes and then the Tsars emulated the Mongol Khans and demanded and mercilessly enforced complete submission to their will from all classes of society. In this reading of Russian history, Soviet communism was not a complete break with the past. The communist strongman was different from the Khan or the Tsar only the extent of his power, and Stalin knew it. He berated Sergei Eisenstein for showing Ivan the terrible is haunted by the consequences of his violence. This is not a film, it is some kind of nightmare, he complained in 1947. Eisenstein should have realized that the trouble with Ivan was not that he was cruel but that he was not cruel enough. 
a mistake Stalin never made. When Ivan had someone executed, he would spend a long time in repentance and prayer. God was a hindrance to him in this respect. He should have been more ruthless. Putin's rule has reinforced the view of Russia as an Asiatic despotism that was so popular among 19th century liberals and socialists. Alexander Herzen described Tsar Nicholas I as Chinggis Khan with a telegraph, the toadying patriarch Krill's blessings of Putin's war crimes in Ukraine and Syria follows a millennia of religious subservience to the state that the Orthodox believed could make Moscow the third Rome with a messianic right to dominate all Orthodox peoples. Of the 800 saints the church created between the conversion of the Rus to Christianity at the end of the first millennium until the 18th century over 100 were princes or princesses. No other country in the world has made so many saints from its rulers, Figas says. Nowhere else has power been so sacralized. Maybe one day we will see the church venerate Street Vladimir the patron saint of saturation bombers. Putin's 2021 essay on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians portrayal of Ukrainians as little Russians was a prelude to the war. It showed where the combination of a bitter nostalgia for lost imperial grandeur and messianic fantasy lead. Little Ukrainian children have no right to escape Big Brother, and if they try they must be punished.